So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hillary. Uh, if you do want to ask any questions, I don't think we'll be taking questions, but you can send them to me on Twitter at hmason. Or if you're too shy to do it, even in that form of public, I'm me at hillarymason.com, pretty easy to find. Uh, so my topic for this morning is the past, present, and future of data engineering, which sounds like a very comprehensive topic. But don't fear, I'm only going to take little stories uh, that hopefully tie an interesting narrative together. It's early, and I hope you have all had your coffee. I mean, this gentleman just said you're going to Budapest, and nobody even screamed, right? <laughs> so uh, I see the purpose of a good opening keynote as to give someone, everyone here something to talk about as they go through the day. So if you agree with me, if you don't agree with me, it's great. Uh, just talk about it. Um, and make sure that, uh, that you let me know as well. So let's just set the stage for where data computing is today. And I'm gonna do that by referring to Reddit. How many people here are familiar with Reddit? Come on, all right, almost everyone. All right, when I explain Reddit to people, I usually say it's the armpit of the social web. And I mean that as a compliment in that Reddit is the sort of environment where, you know, it's not that beautiful. It has the kind of freedom that we don't see in a lot of places, uh, which means that some really horrible stuff ends up on Reddit. And I don't, I don't think anyone would argue with that, but also some really wonderful and creative things sort of emerge from that freedom. And this is one thing that I thought was amazing. So somebody asked this question. If someone from the 1950s appeared today, what would be the hardest thing for us to explain to them about how we live? And here is the best answer. I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. <laughs> what this tells me is that our technology has progressed rapidly, and yet humankind has not. We, we are really consistent beings. Uh, and technology is amazing, uh, and yet there's still a long way to go. Um, but this is a talk primarily about the practice of data engineering, uh, but I don't think it's possible to talk about engineering or data engineering without talking about people and what people do with that data. And so let's begin in the past, the distant past. This, in fact, is 1880, the US in 1880. It doesn't look that dissimilar than uh, the US today. In 1880, the census took seven years to compile, and yet the population in the United States doubled between 1880 and 1890, which meant they had a problem, right? The Constitution requires the census to be completed every 10 years. This was a big data problem. But there were reasons that at that time, uh, technology allowed them to find a solution. And so this guy, who if you remove his mustache, would totally fit in in this room today, his name's Herman Hollerith, and he's from New York, uh, like me, so go New York. Uh, he came up with an idea, and his idea he patented. Uh, it's a machine for counting people, and if you actually do read this patent, it explicitly describes a machine for one purpose only, that is counting people. And this machine was inspired by the way the conductors on trains would mark tickets with punch holes to indicate who had paid their fare. So he saw this and he thought, oh, we can do that around the whole country to count people. And this is what it looked like. So there's a box of cards on the right side, a lot of little dials, um, the actual card punchers up on the table there. And he started a company called the Tabulating Machine Company. Now, Vint Cerf has a wonderful quote that I'm going to mangle slightly, but he said something along the lines of, if computer scientists had named Kentucky Fried Chicken, we would have called it Hot Dead Bird. So. <laughs> Through many mergers and, uh, and other business relationships, Tabulating Machine Company eventually became a company called International Business Machines, which we are all familiar with. And in fact, I'm sure some people uh, who work there are probably here today. Um, and here's, here's a woman actually out in the field using his machine to punch the cards. This is what the cards initially looked like. And um, they had this decoder key where you can actually like sort of figure out. It's actually quite complicated. Um, and in fact, I did figure out that if you're using 8-bit ASCII, you couldn't even fit one tweet on the card. But if you see the comment on the bottom here, someone figured out if you use 6-bit ASCII, you can fit a tweet on the card, but you're limited to only alphanumeric characters. So it gives you a sense of the amount of data we could store in this format. Um, but the punch cards were exactly the size of 1887 US currency, which looked like this. 
which is super badass. I don't know why we don't still have bills that look like this. Um, but the cards were that size because he managed to get a bunch of secondhand treasury boxes to store the cards in. So as an engineer, this tells me there is always a reason why things are the way they are, uh, if you only know the right person to ask. And I was thinking about that when I ran into this question on SuperUser, where uh, somebody very sincerely asked, why does Windows start with the letter C? Now everybody with a bit of gray hair is laughing, and so those of you who don't get it can ask them later. But there's always a reason why things are the way they are. So back to this problem, they figured it out onward. We're going to zoom forward. It's 1906. We have this machine. This is the Hollerith Type 1 tabulation machine. This is the first reprogrammable counting machine. And if you look at the jumpers, they were fashioned after the layout of the punch card. Again, there's always a reason why things are the way they are. This was the first machine that you could reprogram to count different things. So that's pretty cool. They nailed it. Let's, uh, let's go forward again. 1928, uh, IBM standardizes on the punch card we know and love today, which has rectangular punches. Um, it was used for a bunch of businesses at this time. So this is a woman who started her own consulting business where she would come into your business and count all the things you had to count and then she'd leave again. Uh, you can actually buy punch cards on eBay. They're really cheap if you are so inclined. Um, still possible. So 1930s, again, 40 years forward, the word supercomputer is used in New York to describe a, uh, a tabulation machine made for Columbia University. And when I first saw this, I was like, great, they're using it for some amazing research. But of course, no, they were using it to do accounting. Um, and this is the machine that came out in the 30s, the IBM 401. It looked pretty sweet. Again, to set some context, this is Times Square in New York City in the 1930s. That's what it looked like. This is how you got to Denver in the 30s. For those of you who would have come from Chicago, you would have taken this train, which actually looks pretty cool and futuristic. It might be better than the one we have today. So at this point in the 30s, we have reprogrammable machines that can count, multiply, and divide, and they're starting to take over, right? So 1959, again, to set some context, this was a real advertisement. Um, IBM comes out with the 1401, which was a suite of computing machinery. Is there anyone in the room who used one of these? I think maybe we have a few, yes. Um, I'd love to hear some stories later. Um, but a suite of machinery that was, uh, they received more orders for this in the first six weeks after it was announced than they expected to in the lifetime of the product. There was a huge demand for this sort of data engineering and computing machinery at this time. And it cost $2,500 a month. It's a lot of money uh, just to count things. But people were finding ways to use it, um, payroll, freight, uh, anywhere you had to keep track of stuff, right? Again, anywhere where you have to count things. You might sense a theme here. So you program these machines in Fargo, again, uh, a language that was defined, inspired by, in many ways, the layout of those punch cards, an RPG, which in its initial versions was similar, but I believe has changed a lot over the years. Um, and if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I recommend you set several hours aside for it. So the IBM 1401 was famously marketed as being easy to use, but if you actually go and read people's experiences with this machine, they would go through six weeks of training and come out the other side saying, like, I still don't know what's going on. Uh, so in 2006, this composer uh, was inspired by the manual for this machine, which was quite substantial to create an interpretive dance. And I've uh, selected a small clip of it for you here today. <laughs> And if dance and art does anything, it captures the emotional experience um, of the 1401. <laughs> and the, the music is also beautiful and highly recommended. All right, so big data in the 50s. Let's talk about 2013. That was not so long ago, we all remember it. So let's say you want to count a lot of things. You might use something like Hadoop. Um, and you might end up in an environment like this, where you say, tell me what to do. <laughs> it's still not that easy, guys. Okay. Um, they fixed it, though. 
to all credit to, uh, to the Cloudera distribution, it is repaired in 2014. Um, so I love this photo for talking about data engineering um, because every single person in this photo has a device in their hand. And if you look at it closely, you start to see even more things. Like someone in the front has a laptop open in their arms. Um, and people are holding a mix of phones and cameras and devices. Uh, and this is President Obama like campaigning and there's the official documentation, but there's also all of this data being collected by people having this shared experience here. Uh, and so this is an amazing way to understand that we are collecting more data than we ever have before. Um, and yet, we still basically only know how to count it. So let's do some definitions in that you can't talk about data in the present without dealing with a, a few buzzwords, um, and I just want to hit them head on. Um, I've converged on a definition of data engineering uh, that I like. Maybe you don't like it, but I'd love to hear feedback. That is, uh, when you're building a system where the design and the architecture of the system itself depends on the nature of the data flowing through it. And that's how data engineering is slightly distinct from uh, more traditional systems engineering. Now, big data, we have to face this one head on. Uh, I really hate this term. Um, so I'm sort of subverting the definition of this term as well. So some people think big data is too big for Excel. And again, if we have anyone from Microsoft in the room, I know you're working on it. But um, I still hear from people quite often that like, oh, you know, it's too big uh, for Excel, so it must be big data, so I need a Hadoop or something like that. Um, what some people mean here, actually, is that it's too big for them to look at and for them to see patterns in that data. So engineers like to use a different definition of big data. So we say, okay, big data is big if I can't just analyze it in memory on my one computer. And that's getting better, but the problem is that the computer you have today is really quite different than the computer you had two years ago, which is quite different than the computer you'll have two years from now, which is also really different from, uh, like, if you're doing any computing on a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone Black. You know, so one computer doesn't mean one thing, so we need to pin that down a bit. Um, and then what do you get? So what's the difference between being able to do it in memory on one computer versus two computers versus 100 versus 1,000? Um, so what you really get from that is that big data is data made useful in the sense that as a data scientist or engineer, you can ask a question of that data and get an answer back before you forget why you asked that question in the first place. So there's my definition of big data for you. It is data made useful to us as human beings trying to solve real problems. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is that uh, some people think your data has to be really big to be interesting, and this is absolutely not true. Uh, a lot of really interesting work is done on relatively small data, um, which still fits under the, the umbrella of usefulness. So if you have a data set that's gigabytes in size describing some sort of interesting human behavior, like say dating, uh, you're going to do something way more interesting with that data than somebody ha who has petabytes of something uh, less compelling. All right, so data scientists, um, that is my job title actually for the first time in my life, but I do want to clarify why I think the term data scientist is worth hanging on to. Um, I know it's a bit controversial as well. Data scientists don't do anything that people haven't done for a really long time. So people have uh, done math and statistics for a very long time. They have written code for a very long time and they have asked good questions for a very long time, but uh, they have never done it before in one professional position. Um, and that's something that's possible now because it is much easier to apply all of these things together so that you don't need to, to dedicate your expertise to merely one facet of it. Rather, it's, it's possible to understand how to do all three things. And when I say ask the right questions, that is really the hardest skill uh, of a data scientist that is there's no greater insult than you have an elegant solution to an irrelevant problem. And there are lots of reasons this is happening now. Uh, I think many of those reasons are sitting here in this room, but we have, we have the tools to do this. We have the CPU power to do it. It's affordable. We have the data. Uh, and we sort of know how to write algorithms to do interesting things. 
So let's talk about what the real life of a data, data engineer is like briefly. I was guessing everyone here would be around my age so I could use my favorite movie references and I, I think it worked. Um, the data engineering process today uh, in many companies looks something like this. So you say, okay, I have some data, I have a question. Um, I'm gonna use my Hadoop cluster and run a job that's gonna take some hours or I'm going to you know, play with it in IPython or in R and figure out the right approach to solving the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, and then if it's the kind of thing we wanna build a product around, I'm going to go redesign new infrastructure um, that takes advantage of all the shortcuts I learned in that previous research process. And then I'm gonna you know, try and deploy that and see where it fails and then I'm gonna keep iterating until, until it works. And that's how you take something that looks like this and you know, end up with something that looks like that. You end up writing a lot of code like this that gets thrown away uh, just to count things given the overhead of using the infrastructure. So in many cases, data engineering today resembles this process uh, where you have an idea, you have some data, you have an approach, and you just keep doing it over and over again until you get something uh, useful. And so you might ask the question, like, are we today in a utopia or a dystopia? Um, and I, I'm definitely going to err on the side of optimism, and I'll tell you why. Uh, here are some things people are doing with data today that I find amazing, and I'm not gonna give you examples from finance uh, or from advertising, because I think those are a little bit too obvious. Um, this is an app called Dark Sky. I have no connection to this app whatsoever, but this is a group of people who take public US government weather data, your GPS location, do a micro forecast and send up an alert on your phone when it's about to rain right where you are. It's really cool. Um, and if you don't have an iPhone, which I don't, they have a website called forecast.io and they also have an API so you can build this sort of weather micro forecasting into your own applications. Uh, this is a woman named Lauren Talbot who gave a talk at Data Gotham where she talked about how uh, the mayor's office of analytics under Mayor Bloomberg in New York City uh, decided to use data in the city uh, to improve the problems that the city is charged with, uh, with improving. Uh, the problem she and her team looked at was ambulance response time. So they took data from, they tried to understand the process. So the call goes into the call center, the operator on 911 talks to the person. At some point they hand off to another agency. The agency will eventually direct the call to the ambulance. The ambulance will go to the scene. Um, so they looked at every stage in this process. Um, her talk is actually amazing because the statistics here are fairly straightforward. What's really interesting is that they were able to actually measure the order in which the operators should be asking their questions when you call 911, like what's the most optimal way to get to the answer as quickly as possible. And they also looked at where the ambulances should wait in New York City for the calls to come in um, and of course they found out the ambulances don't sit anywhere near the optimal point for them to sit given the prediction of call volume. Instead of telling them what to do, they actually asked the ambulance drivers, like why do you sit where you sit? And they said because there's a 24 hour bathroom and coffee shop here. Uh, so they found them 24 hour services closer to the optimal points and over all of these fairly minor interventions, they reduced the ambulance response times by a minute in New York City. This is a big data success. Um, this one is uh, the Jawbone Up. I don't know how many people have some form of accelerometer on their person today. Anyone? A few people sheepishly are saying yes. Um, so this thing measures your steps in your sleep and it's a fairly simple device. Um, but Monica Rogatti, their VP of data, put this together where uh, during daylight savings time, the average user of the Jawbone lost 11 minutes of sleep uh, because of daylight savings time. If you project that out to the US population, that is 6,000 years of lost sleep because of our daylight savings time policies. So uh, maybe you can actually learn something from these little devices that we're each gathering data for our own personal uh, edification that can direct policy, that can actually help us as a society make better decisions. All right, so two more examples. Uh, this one I love, it's from Communications of the ACM describing a research project where linguists use machine learning algorithms to take our modern spoken languages, the rate of mutation in our modern languages, and to reverse engineer the ancestral language from which our modern languages descended. What's notable about this is that it is a problem that could not be done without the deep domain expertise of the linguists. 
um, but also could not be done without the computation ability of modern technology. Um, and in fact, one of the linguists in the article is quoted saying, computation is the new handmaid of science, meaning instead of mathematics, we've gone pretty far in mathematics, now we have computation as well. All right, the last example is, uh, you can actually read about this in Wired. Um, it turns out if you include bacon in a recipe, it boosts the ratings that recipe gets. So if, if you're looking to, uh, to game the system, you can also use ingredients like cream cheese and strawberries and avocado to uh, you know, sort of uh, boost the attention for your recipes, something we might not know without a lot of data. So no, no talk about data is complete without a graph that goes up and to the right. I like this one because it goes down and to the right too. Um, but it, it does make the point that we are still at the beginning of collecting and figuring out what we can do with all that stuff. Um, so it is easy to be very optimistic. Right. So to the future. Um, our capabilities are growing, but they're growing in, in a bunch of different ways. So um, at Excel, we've seen a whole layer of infrastructure companies that is uh, giving us the tools to store data and retrieve data efficiently. Um, we've started to see tools on top of that that make it easier to do fairly complex analyses. Um, not so much to say that uh, if you were not capable of doing it before, you're capable of doing it now, but rather if it would have taken you two weeks to program it before, now it might take you a few days. We still have a long way to go in making, uh, building these sorts of systems accessible, cheap, and easy to do accurately. So there's always a caution there. Um, this is one where I hope it's very provocative. I hope data systems use natural language. I've seen a few things uh, on the natural language input, so English to SQL type translation. I've also seen things like Narrative Sciences released a product that takes your Google Analytics report and emails it to you in plain English, natural language generation. It's totally fascinating. And I hope that the people who are building the infrastructure will think about this sort of user experience as well. Um, and maybe someday we'll get there. It's a great movie. All right. Another thing I think about a lot is uh, hardware. It is really easy to build things with hardware today. Um, and yet the data scientists don't really talk to the hardware hackers all that much. But that's going to change um, because the cost of hardware is getting so much lower in the same way that the cost of data infrastructure became so much cheaper in the last few years. Uh, and the two things just go together naturally. So we are bringing our capability of collecting data from the online world, from social media, into the real world, uh, where we can, can hopefully do good things with that. Um, anyone get that one? No? It's Jurassic Park. Fun. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is one that, um, that I think everyone who's actually here at ApacheCon uh, already knows, which is that none of this happens without a strong community that actually comes together, uh, thinks about what the future should look like, and supports each other in achieving that future. Um, and it's been really uh, rewarding to be at least a small part of our data community um, and to see things like this event happen and go forward and to see how people are reaching out and bringing new people into the community. Um, this is necessary for, uh, for that future growth, right? Oh, and if you are in New York, we have a small event there called Data Gotham, which is a lot of fun. And yes, that is both a Jay-Z and a Batman reference, right? So again, I'll just conclude by saying that uh, hopefully this has been an interesting tour of a bunch of little rabbit holes. Um, I find the pace of change in the way people think about managing data to be completely fascinating. Um, it is astounding in many ways that in 2014, we are still really just able to count things. Uh, we are only starting to be able to do uh, more interesting things than that, and yet uh, the future is pretty bright. I do like to say that data gives us superpowers, but I mean that in a very literal sense, that it gives us the ability to perceive things and take action in the world about things that we otherwise, as raw human beings, could never perceive. So data is making us smarter, and data infrastructure is making it possible. Uh, so let's make more of that. So thank you very much, and I hope to talk to you about it later. Thank you.